Welcome back to the program. In case you're just joining us, it's still Money Line with me, Nancy Neji. Today, we will be looking at the state of the economy, like I said at the beginning of the program. So many things to touch, but let's see the ones we can touch around the economy and uh, let's try as much as possible to dissect them. With me in the studio is Michael Enahoro. He's an economic analyst. He just told me during the break that he's, should I say? Go ahead. <laughs> 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 you know, because... Uh, that you try to conclude your thesis, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. My dissertation on uh, my doctoral thesis is being done right now. So I am focused on development finance and projects. And projects. That's nice. I would like to perhaps read it when you're done. Of course, of you course. You send of course. Do you mind if you send it to me? Yes, of course. And okay. it's, it's focused on one of the parts of the economy that's actually performing. Yeah. The, the outlook is to sort of look at the what's the impact on the expanse of the GSM network mm. and the penetration of the GSM network on a social economic impact on youth and Nigerians as a whole? How mm. much have we changed? Oh, we've really changed. In the last two, in the we've last really 20 changed. years. The business so climate has also changed. You see a lot of things, yes. e-commerce, yes. a lot of things coming out as a result of, uh, through that, of that, through that, yes. through that space. So, yeah. so now should we be looking at incorporating more technology into our, our systems our processes. Yes, and our economic development targets. Mm, mm. We, okay. need, we need to look at technology because, again, I saw a bit of the detail that telecommunications the has contributed. The GDP contribute, was coming to that. Yes, yes. And then and we need to say, and we need to take a look at those things. Yeah. Okay. So fantastic. All right. Uh, Dr. Milafia, Dr. Benara Milafia is a development economist, a former deputy governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. Doctor, I haven't forgotten you. I know you're joining me from just the Plateau State Capital. I haven't been there in a long time. Doctor, are you there? Can I see you? Yes. Hello. How are you? Doctor, good to see you. This should be a happy new year. I haven't seen you this year. Best of the new year to you, Nancy, and to my colleague here, and all our wonderful viewers within and outside the country. It's lovely to be here. How is Joss, doctor? Joss is quite cold, you know. It's as if you are in uh, London or somewhere. It's a bit cold. Mm -hmm. um, 10, 12 degrees sometimes. So, um, well, it's okay. Uh, can't complain. It's, it's lovely here. Okay. Uh, doctor, I'll be coming to you in a bit. But before I come to you, I would like to uh, get a clearer picture of you. So, uh, please, I would uh, appreciate perhaps you can... Uh, you know, the, the, the window blind. by your side, yes, the blind by your side, can you just close it a bit because we're getting reflection mm -hmm. so that I can see your face better. But I'll come back to you in a short while. Let me start with uh, Michael here. Yes. GDP numbers, I was just mm -hmm. analyzing uh, the numbers on the world. What do you think? On the first look, it, it, quarter three, quarter four, you can see some positive movements in, 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 in the key areas. Um, if you're looking at um, oil, our production was steady. So for the whole year, we've seen that the whole year, the production has steadied at 2 million, averaging 2 million and just a bit above more. Um, then the real numbers, the real GDP numbers in that sector is also a positive of about 5.6%. It doesn't reflect the overall view of what the market is saying. And if I take a, a, a closer look at the three areas that we are actually looking that has had positives, agri production is what excites me because we've seen a growth over the last four quarters leading towards this point. So w if I want to tag that back to the Ancoboros program that is already and more farmers getting in tune in producing, yes, that is a positive that I see. But everything remains a bit steady and streamlined. Are we doing better than 2018 in some of the fiscal sectors and some of the real sectors? Yes. Mm. Um, are we seeing cash flow improve in terms of those areas? No. So we're taking a look at certain parts of the IMF's take on where we are vis-a-vis -vis the physical work that has been done in the different areas plus the fiscal policies of the CBN. Are they beginning to take hold right now over the last 12 months? Yes. But is it the kind of acceleration that the economy needs? It's mm. still a bit too early because some of those fiscal policies need time and adoption by the real sector actors to take hold. So again, um, am I excited about quarter four and the 
2019 outlook, um, it's a cautionary review. It's a cautionary review for me. Okay, cautionary review. Dr. Melafi, if you can um, join us right now, what are your views? The GDP uh, growth rate for 2019, full year came in at 2.22%. Percent. That's 2.27 percent. That's full year. Fourth quarter came in at two and a half a percent. You've had Michael. I'll say he's uh, observing with caution. Uh, as someone that has been uh, at the Apex Bank as deputy governor and as a development economist, break down some of those things for us so that an average Nigerian can actually understand what we're talking about and is it the kind of growth that will propel us to where we want to be that will lift 100 million nigerians out of poverty in the next 10 years as president buhari has mentioned well nancy we we've come a long way haven't we um modest growth at the end of the year uh you know at least over two percent um it's still, you know, slow recovery, uh, but we are coming from somewhere where, in fact, in 2017, we experienced minus growth, which had not been seen since uh, our terrible civil war. Uh, so from that backdrop, we've, we've, we're kind of climbing up slowly. But uh, my worry either is that the recovery is still quite slow because population is growing at almost 3% annually. Um, here we are still uh, less than 2.5% annual growth. So in net terms, we are still growing negatively vis-a-vis -vis the exponential increase in population. Now, yes, agriculture has shown some good signs and people in technology are doing some interesting things uh, that offers us huge potentials. Um, uh, but I still worry about manufacturing, uh, that we could have done much better. And also agriculture still poses some issues. Uh, um, you know, there are still elements of food scarcity, especially during the festive season of Christmas, which we just went through. Um, and then um, the rural agrarian countryside, because I'm a country boy and I visit uh, my villages, uh, you know, uh, I have a passion for rural farmers and, and what is happening in the rural countryside. And it still leaves me very, very concerned. The majority of our people live in the rural areas majority of our people, nearly 60 percent, are still farmers. But there is no peace in the countryside. It's an irony that the cities and the towns today are more peaceful than the rural countryside. We are unwittingly destroying the economic backbone of this country, which is agrarian peasant agriculture. We could have grown so much more if we had put our act together with regard to rural agriculture. Uh, that, that worries me quite a lot. And that is why the IMF delegation, the Article 4 delegation recently down, downgraded their forecasts uh, to just around 2%, up from about 2.5. So, you know, um, you know, we still have a lot of work to do. Mm. Uh, okay. Okay, doctor, let me stick with you a bit because looking at this inflation numbers for 2019, I also did analyze the one for 2018 and perhaps we, we grew averagely at around close to 2% in 2018. Uh, would you uh, say that perhaps we are also experiencing right now stagflation in the sense that uh, we're having slower economic growth. I don't really want to say stagnated, but I'm also pushed to say stagnated in a bit that if you see how we have grown since 2018, it's been close to just 2%. So are we really at this time suffering a condition known as stagflation, whereby we have slower economic growth, high unemployment rate, 
higher inflation numbers, 12.13% in January. And the analysts I spoke to last week, two of them on the inflation numbers, they did tell me, Nancy, we, we may just expect more headline inflation uh, in the months to come. So what do you think? Well, I, I think stagflation is the right word. Uh, um, I mean, uh, but the, the decline, the, I mean, the increase in inflation is, is, is uh, not substantial. We are still not within single digit. But when you're talking of really high inflation, you should be talking at anything close to 17 to yeah, Exactly. So still, I would have preferred single digit. Uh, um, but you could say stagflation. Uh, you would be right because in a situation where you have high inflation as well as high unemployment and slow growth. What also worries me is that collectively the macro economy is experiencing what I call quantum deceleration. Mm -hmm. We're decelerating from almost a decade of sustained, mm. you know, growth. economic yeah, growth. That was almost 7% during 2004 to 2014. Uh, and when you look back at that period, you, you get more concerned about you know, the slow, slow road of growth today and the increasing unemployment and underemployment, worsening poverty and worsening inequality. And then on top of that, you have terrible, terrible insecurity. You can't exaggerated. I mean, try going on the Kaduna road from Abuja, even on train. You know, the entire ministers that went for El Rufai's 60th birthday the other weekend were nearly mobbed and killed by bandits. If that can happen to ministers, then ordinary people, you know, you can imagine what they're facing. I mean, you can't run a country like this. This is a serious matter where kidnapping, banditry, nihilistic violence have become a way of life. This is completely unacceptable and intolerable. Mm -hmm. And of course, it will drive away uh, investors. Mm -hmm. It will lead to financial hemorrhage and capital flight. So these are very serious issues. Okay. Um, let, let me come to Michael. Doctor, still stick with me a bit. I'll come back to you in a, uh, in a short while. Doctor has listed some of the challenges. Yeah. You know, for me doing the show for the many years that I've done it now, saying these things almost every day is like a sickening. Yeah. You know, it's, it's really heartbreaking because these are numbers that stay in the face. And not just numbers, they are, they are also humans. Because no, I learned from Paul Kugman. Uh, the Nobel laureate for economics, they say that it's not just about money, it's about people. So when we're looking at these numbers now, mm -hmm. what you did, what I did, we're mm -hmm. all included in yes. these GDP numbers. And what is really affecting the economy, insecurity, a whole lot of things are all in those numbers. Yes. Do you think that the economy has gotten the kind of attention it deserves in terms of tackling, or perhaps tackling is a soft word, in terms of, you know... No, it, it just m handling the economy. Yes. Uh, I, I, I'll tell you this. A lot of people, um, just to buttress on Dr. Milafia's point, what is the cost mm. of non-performance of our economy? We need to look at that cost. How many farmers are out of job right now that could have produced at least half a hectare worth of corn or items? How many people did we lose that would have added to those GTP numbers to have taken agriculture production, crop production higher. So what's the cost? Right now we need to evaluate the cost. The indices that we see and the processes for the last one year by the CBN in trying to control our finances is just only a portion of what needs to be done by the government. CBN can't do it alone. I mean, it's, 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 it's clear. They can deal with the monetary aspect and manage the fiscal end of it. But again, what are the policies that are supportive of this role that should drive the kind of development we need? Okay, so what's our security policy? What is the cost to us for not securing the states that are being challenged right now? What is the cost to Nigeria? 
Are we looking at our mining sector? Because the numbers for mining are appalling. Yes, I, I looked at that on so, Thursday. So, so and, and part of the reason is the nobody can get to the mines if the areas are being contested or are contest. there's a contention in getting to the mines. So what is that cost to Nigeria? What is the cost of us being on the road that you can't get from Shagamu to this because there is banditry happening on the road? That 10,000 vehicles carrying an average of four people who should have businesses to transact across those states. What is the cost to Nigeria for keeping those people on the road for nine, ten hours because bandits have taken over the road? And f don't forget this. Road transportation moves our money as well because it is the primary source for us to do yeah. commerce. So if you take out the Lagos Ibadan Expressway or the Shagamu Bini Expressway or the Kaduna Abuja Expressway, what is the cost to us? We need to start evaluating the cost to the country so that we can then apportion certain policies and actions and initiatives by the federal government as a short term. Now, the question is, I understand what to you're saying. To deal with that, the cost. Why are the policies coming through the National Assembly? But the only thing, Lancy, to, to come ar at a round point to ask you a question. What's missing is a, is, is a comprehensive national strategy that the mm. CBN is dealing with the fiscal and monetary aspects of it. The but CBN is supposed to deal with monetary, nothing concerning fiscal. So, so, uh, but, but the other aspects of it. They are doing development finance. That's what I'm telling you. They need to deal with that because a lot of the initiatives are, and the interventions that are coming in short term to carry us through are being impacted as well. Now, you're saying we should have a national strategy. Yes. Isn't it? Do you think that there is an awakening of the fact that this is an emergency situation and we need to deal with it squarely? Or we are all just in silos, pockets of us saying, these are the things happening, except it happens to you, mm. you will know the, that yes, it's not, you know, it's, it's not just a soft case. Yes. These are hard issues that we really need to contend with. Yeah, but Dr. Milafe said it. How, how do you run the country? when you cannot go from point A to B. All your produce cannot come out of where they are produced and hit to the areas where they can be processed. If you look at the processed facts of, if you look at the section that focuses on agricultural production, we've done badly in manufacturing, Dr. Melafia said that. So it just means that we're not processing enough. And our capacity as a country to produce is badly hampered if food and produce cannot get to where they can be transformed into economic, uh, economic value for us. So the numbers don't lie. Those who are running the country see them and they understand them. So n inaction I I is a cost in itself. Mm. So yeah. we need to take action, but it, it, must be a, it, it, it must be a, a joint up national strategy to deal with this issue. Okay, let, let me come to Dr. Milafia. Doctor, if you can, if you're still with us and if you can still hear me, uh, Michael has said the cost of inaction is huge. Uh, we also need to measure perhaps cost of non-performance. But at this point, um, what do you think is really wrong with us? Why our economy is growing at a very slow, I would say, snail speed compared to our size and compared to our potentials? Uh, beyond the political rhetorics. And I asked that question intentionally uh, because I've seen like over the years, at least since we returned to democracy from 1999 till now, uh, one party would come, okay, there's been PDP, I think from 1999 till 2015. 2015. I think so. Now it's an APC government. And the APC did say, okay, PDP uh, plunged the country into a whole lot of, things that are bad, we're trying to repair all of that now. But I want to ask you to, as someone that came out for the number one position in the country, and I'm asking this question very deliberately, in terms of how do we really begin the conversation of economic development, honest economic development, to get our people back to work, to attract people into the country for businesses? I did ask in one of my sessions, how should Nigeria be a people and a money magnet? Uh, also make us that are local secure. So how do we get that conversation going and face it very honestly beyond our political divides? I'm asking it intentionally. 
Yeah, thank you, um, Nancy. You impressed me a lot. I mean, you're making reference to somebody I also admire, uh, you know, um, Paul Krugman, Nobel laureate. He has a regular column in New York Times called The Conscience of a Liberal. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I'm also, Nigel, um, I'm, I'm fully in agreement with what he, the sentiments he's expressed, you know, that, you know, the cost of inaction is very, very huge. Now, how can we um, begin, you know, to build up momentum? Number one, there is need for a broad national consensus. Right now, the divisions within our country have become deeper than ever before. In fact, they've gone beyond ideological politics and partisan politics. It's not a question of just APC versus PDP and so on. It's gone beyond that. What's at stake is the very destiny of our country, um, our nationhood and its future, and the future of our children, uh, that is in serious peril right now because of our total lack of vision, our total lack of direction, and our total lack of national purpose. So we need to go back and build a broad, broad national consensus on the way forward. Nigeria is a very poor country. We may be rich in resources, but we have the poorest number of poor people in the world having overtaken India. The numbers can't lie. So we have to worry about that. We have to build a framework where we can lift over 100 million of our people out of poverty by creating, secondly, after building a national consensus, by creating the framework in which peace and security can exist. That is the first duty of a state because our democracy is running the risk of being redefined as a government of bandits run by bandits for the interest of all the bandits. And it is a very frightening scenario. So we need to retrace our steps and build a framework of peace and social harmony. And next to that, of course, mobilize resources for investments in critical sector, such as human capital, education, infrastructures. And we must change the way government works. Mm. The big elephant in the room is the civil service. Nobody's talking about public sector reforms. Uh, no matter how visionary you are as a leader, uh, you need the civil service to implement your programs. And if they are not having what it takes, your vision will get nowhere. Of course, we have to fix the power and energy issue. Uh, we need to rebuild uh, young people's empowerment with skills, and particularly women. The stature of a civilization is judged by the way it treats its women. We must empower them and put them in the mainstream of national development and governance. These are some of the few points that I would, you know, bring forward at this at this stage um, to build a stable and a free democracy that works and that delivers the best life for our people. Okay, uh, Doctor, still in that line, uh, since of course you're a technocrat and you came out also uh, to seek for the number one office, I'm, I'm being forced to stay on that line. Why in a beat? Because politics is really essential mm -hmm. for good yes. economics. I remember yes. some years ago, uh, I think in 2017 or so, I had a topic. I did a series, I think for one week, good politics, yeah. good economics, you yeah. know. Now, why do you think it is difficult for us to get our politics right? Because it seems that f even from what I'm seeing, Anything you say now is being taken along a political line. Mm -hmm. It's not really taking it along that, you know, I mean well for the country and I want the country to be better than I am seeing it right now. What will it take for us to fix our politics wherein we fix our economy? I hope you understand what I'm saying because if you're taking a look at uh, from 1999 till now, we've had two parties. 
say this saying that I don't want to go into what's happening right now. It's not my business, the judiciary and all of that. But I'm saying that what will it take for us to be that?